Uh, welcome to the third lecture in our Couch to 5K lecture series. Um, as you know, because we talk a lot, I'm Catherine Pope and this is Stephanie Van Dyke, my business partner. We're starting the Sky Lakes Wellness Center. Um, so before we get started, let's do just a little bit of housekeeping. Did everyone get a punch in their punch card? Yes. Great. And does everyone have a raffle ticket? Yes. yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and just a, a quick reminder, the mud run is July 20th. Um, Stephanie and I plan on doing it, either walking or running the obstacle course. Um, so we're going to be wearing our Couch to 5K t-shirts and we hope to have a Couch to 5K team. So really, we hope that you all join us for this. Doesn't matter how fast you are, how slow you are, we're just going to do it for fun. And if you just feel comfortable walking, we're more than happy to split up. One of us, Catherine, can walk or run, I can walk or run. So please don't feel intimidated if you don't feel up to speed with jogging. It makes no difference. That's right. That's absolutely right. So we're ha this is lecture three. We're This is the halfway point through the lecture series. And some of us are doing really well. Uh, Lake of the Woods was last weekend, and there were 164 participants. And some of us aren't, including myself. I went on vacation for a couple weeks and did not run at all. And I've had a horrible time getting started again. So we really want to take this time to remind you of why we're doing this, why exercise and physical activity are good for you, and to re-inspire you if you're having trouble or just to continue that inspiration if you're already doing really well. So it's going to be a little interactive today, so uh, feel free to join in. Um, so why are we doing this? Why is it important to exercise, and how is exercise good for you? Your health. Your blood pressure. Health. Blood pressure. You might want to live longer. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Prevent diabetes. That's right. Sure. Diabetes. Yep. Endorphins. Exactly. It makes you feel happier, reduces anxiety. Great. Um, and how often are you supposed to exercise? Every day. Every day. Great. Good. Good. <laughs> yes, that's more ambitious than even I am. Um, what some people say is exercise uh, five times a week, 30 minutes a day. But really what the most important thing to do is 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise. So that's like a brisk walk. Or you can do 75 minutes of an intense exercise, which is like a jog or a run. The CDC also recommends that you do weight training two times a week. So good job on the first question and answer period of today's lecture. Um, do you have the, do you want to pull up the video? Sure. Uh, so just as a little reminder of why we're doing this, why it's good for you, why you should continue to be inspired, we're just going to watch a quick little video. It will be nine minutes. And you guys, if it's not loud enough, please shout out. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and welcome to this visual lecture I'm calling 23 and a half hours. So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network, and I, I mean that in the old sense of the word. Uh, weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all these things are incredibly important, and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category, but I, I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What is the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? So I did my research, and I, I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky, because you know all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, but I picked up this intervention, and because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems, and that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list, so this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47%. In older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50%. For patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions, it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58%. Postmenopausal woman who had four hours a week of the treatment had a 41% reduction in the risk of hip fracture. It reduced anxiety by 48% in a big meta-analysis. Patients suffering from depression, 30 percent were relieved uh, with low dose and that bumped to 47 percent as we uh, increased the dose um, following over 10,000 Harvard alumni for over 12 years those that had the intervention 
had a 23% lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment. It's the number one treatment of fatigue, and of course, the kind of outcome of choice there, my favorite outcome is quality of life, which is really all of the above, and, and really about making your life better. And this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is, what's the, what's the medicine, and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons. And, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm... Um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day, so there's 24 hours, and so you might spend most of your day, you know, this varies obviously, but, uh, you know, couch surfing, sitting at work, obviously sleeping, and what um, the evidence that I'm going to show you kind of tells me is the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active, maybe an hour, and that uh, if you can do that, you can realize all the benefits I've described in the previous slide. So let's just take a quick walk through some of the literature. So Stephen Blair, uh, he's a professor at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina, and he looked at this in what's called the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study, which followed over 50,000 men and women over time. And uh, along the less left side of this graph is something called attributable fractions, which is uh, kind of fancy word, but it's the estimate of the number of deaths in a population that would have been avoided if that specific risk factor had been erased. So for example, turning a smoker into a non-smoker or a couch potato into a daily walker. And along the bottom is the typical risk factors. You can see the uh, hypertension is incredibly important and so on and so forth. But the one that was most, that kind of applied the most risk was this sort of mysterious CRF, which is cardiorespiratory fitness, which is really low fitness. So low fitness was the strongest predictor of death. And, and this is important that most of the trials we see, to be honest, are funded by uh, pharma or, or um, other companies because they've got a drug for hypertension or high cholesterol or diabetes. And we rarely see fitness thrown into the mix. And so it's nice to see uh, a trial that's not so siloed. Uh, Blair's work is interesting. He also did another uh, trial looking at um, uh, obesity. What he found was you know, sort of two things. One is obesity and no exercise, that's a very bad combination. And that's where we saw many of the negative consequences of obesity from a health point of view. But if the, if the obese person was active, even if they didn't have the weight loss, but were just active and obese, that was much, much better and that the, that the exercise ameliorated much of the negative consequences of uh, obesity. Um, so if exercise is a medicine, what's a dose? And when I think of, of, of dose, I think of how long, how often, and how intense. I'm going to give you a slightly mixed message, but essentially uh, more activity is better. But I must say the rate of return seems to decline after 20 or 30 minutes a day. So if you're being active less than 150 minutes a week, or, or more if you're a kid, an hour a day if you're a kid, my flag goes up in the clinic. So my personal take on this is that um, you know, the literature draws a very broad brush, uh, and so we see big differences when somebody goes from not doing anything to doing something, and after that the return is more granular. So if we took the nurse's health study, a woman who went from zero activity to just one hour a week uh, reduced their heart disease rates by um, almost half. So you can break it down, so it can be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes if you want to do uh, 30 minutes of exercise, so it can be broken into three higher intensity, it looks like it's it's equivalent to less time with lower intensity. Uh, but I think, uh, the, obviously, the clinical pearl is mostly thinking about your, your style and habits and your personal cues. So if you're only going to do it if it's pre-booked with friends, you know, I have couples that take a half hour walk every morning or evening to organize their life. A dog is a great uh, walking coach. Uh, the data is showing 67% of dog walkers achieve 158 minutes a week just with the dog walking. And finally, of course, your commute, you know, getting off stop early, taking the stairs, and so on and so forth. So thinking about that, I'm just going to walk you through some quick uh, slices of the literature. Uh, the first one comes from Japan. In, in, the, in the 90s, uh, Japan required all employers to conduct annual health screens for uh, their employees. And so a large gas company in Japan called Osaka uh, used this to answer a great question. Um, so people's walk to work was longer, did that reduce their chance of serious health problems? So in this example, high blood pressure. And what they found is under 10 minute walk, no difference. 11 to 20 minute walk, 12% reduction in rates of high blood pressure or hypertension. And over 21 minute walk, a 29% decrease in rates of high blood pressure. So uh, the authors calculated that for every increase of 10 minutes in your walk to work, there was a 12% reduction in the likelihood of getting high blood pressure. The second exhibit, 
is uh, looking at stents. So this is something we commonly do down medicine. So you can see on the left here the artery is blocked, on the right a vascular surgeon has gone in and uh, put in a balloon, opened it up and left a stent to keep it open, which makes great sense. So a German researcher named Reiner Hambrecht uh, looked at this with about 100 cardiac patients. He got half the group to exercise, and by that I mean 20 minutes a day on an exercise bicycle, and then once weekly, 60 minute aerobics class. And the other half got the high tech stent and just their sort of normal activity. And after one year, 88% of the exercises were event free compared to 70% of the people that got a stent. Um, so both worked, uh, but I find it you know, sort of incredible that the, uh, the low tech uh, made a bigger difference. And you have to remember that the stent just fixes one part of the heart. The next way to think about it is the reverse. So what I call sitting disease. We know that being sedentary is bad for your health, but uh, a researcher named Leonard Veerman uh, wanted to quantify this, and he did so down in Australia in a big study they did there. They found, compared with persons who watch no TV, those who spend a lifetime average of six hours a day watching TV can expect to live about five years left. I mean, that's incredible. But then I think, oh, who watches six hours a day of TV? Uh, and it turns out the average adult in the USA spends about five hours a day uh, watching TV or screens. So I, th I find this fascinating that um, we never think of the TV as uh, something that's bad for our health, but clearly it's as powerful as many other risk factors for chronic disease. So I'm just going to leave you with, uh, well, I guess, two quotes. So one is Terry Garcia, the, the, the singer who was the lead singer for the Grateful Dead, and he said, Somebody has to do something. It's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. And I, I think that's true. <laughs> that for some reason, it has to be us. As Hippocrates said, uh, walking is man's best medicine. And so I'm going to finish by asking you a question. And this may have some personal challenges for you. So, you, you know, you might be very busy with work or kids or both. And you, or you may be uh, in pain or have other priorities. But um, um, my question to you is, can you limit your sitting and sleeping to just 23 and a half hours a day? So something to think about. Thank you very much.